Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. It's good to see everybody today. And uh, just as Trina was leading us in that song, I was thinking, you know, if we're a Christian, born again by the Spirit of God, if Jesus lives on the inside, we should treat people according to who we are, not according to who they are. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Our scripture readings today is from three different passages, all in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First passage, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. So now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all members of the body, though are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians twelve twenty seven through 30 Now you are Christ's body and individual members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues, are all all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus this morning, thanking you for this opportunity to be here, Lord God, always together in the house of God. You said, as we see the days drawing near, you know, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So, Lord, we've assembled here today to hear your word, Lord, to fellowship with one another, and to worship you most of all. Lord, we ask that you would be with every aspect of the service, for those that run the equipment, Lord God, and those that do the singing and the leading, Father, and the piano playing. And, Lord, most of all, we ask for that you just speak through Brother Doug a powerful word today, and we'll give you the glory. Be with Chuck now as he comes to share his testimony and song. In Jesus' name, amen. Chuck, it's, come on up, Chuck. Chuck uh, wanted to share his testimony. And, and what's significant about today, it's more about tomorrow. Tomorrow is Chuck's 89th birthday. And so in honor of his birthday, he wants to come and share a song and, and a testimony. Trina is going to come up and help him out with the song. And, and uh, pay attention to the words of the song. That's part of the testimony. I'd rather have Jesus. God bless you, brother. I'm let the Lord speak. All right. Here you go.
today share my testimony I know every one of you who are saved has a testimony and you need to make plans someday to share it with the church and others about how God has blessed you through your lifetime I became a Christian in 1950 in June at a Saturday revival held by a lay minister who was a coal miner his name was Brother Carty I never, ever knew his first name, although I served under him for two years. Uh, During my lifetime, I have spent 42 years and eight months serving our country in one position or another, and God has always been there to protect me. He's kept me safe all these years, and I have been through all the wars, including the Gulf, and uh, God has always been with me. I saw many of my friends uh, taken away in body bags, but God somehow kept me safe, and I've always been thankful for that. I know that as I try to serve Jesus in my daily life, I'm not always perfect. And I wanted to let everybody know, because I know everybody is not perfect. But one day when we go to be with Jesus, we will be perfect. Amen. And so that is the thought I keep on my mind in my daily prayers and my Bible study that one day God will make me a perfect person. And so I'd share with you today, you should share your testimony with someone and with your church because people need to know how you feel about Jesus. And I love Jesus because he loves me. So I would share that with you today and say thank you for listening to me. And may God bless each and every one of you, not only today, but through your lifetime. Amen. 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 God bless you, brother. Yes, sir. God bless you. Children's are dismissed for Children's Church. We no- notice we did that deliberately. Normally we do it earlier. But, you know, kids need to hear what Chuck had to say. And, and we hope to continue this. It, it, the Lord has laid something on your heart. And, and you have a testimony. I'd like to hear more testimonies. You know, the, uh, the Lord doesn't speak just through the preacher. He speaks through every one of us, whether it's one-on-one with a neighbor or even from here when you express a testimony, and I'd like to hear more. Looking forward to having Sid come with us next week and share his testimony. Today, we're, as we continue the sermon series, our Christian walk, we, we, we looked... talking about a Christian walk for all these many years. And we talk about our Christian walk, and we talked over the last couple of weeks about being a living and holy sacrifice for the Lord. And and, and we look at that as our reasonable act of worship. 
We are to be that sacrifice as we renew our minds in the things of God rather than filling our minds with the things of the world. We talked about that for the last couple of weeks. And let's review that in Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. And this sets the stage for today. Uh, Verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, Paul goes into particulars now as we read through in this sermon series. We're going to be going through chapters 12, 13, and 14 beginning of chapter 15 over the next uh, month or so. And, and as we look at this, he goes into particulars now. What does that being a holy and living sacrifice look like in everyday life? And, and, and at first, as we go through chapter 12, the end of chapter 12, Paul talks about our relationship with other people. And more specifically, as we look at verses uh, three through um, three through sixteen, we look at those relationships with those within the church. And three through eight is talking about our relationship or our service within the church. And this is what we're looking at today: equipped to serve is our sermon title today. And if you get nothing else, if you don't remember anything else about the message today, I want you to remember this. We were never called, as we were called to the Lord, we were never called to be a Lone Ranger Christian. We do not walk this Christian life alone. Dr. Douglas Moo, he's a highly respected professor of uh, New Testament at Wheaton College, and he's the author of many of my commentaries and a number of my seminary books, textbooks, And he made this statement in his commentary on Romans here. He says, television church, or if I may interject, the internet church, the Facebook church, those that worship online, he says it is not church. Just because thousands of people watch the same service, listen to the same sermon, does not make it so. And he says, why not? In verses 3 through 8, Paul suggests two reasons, as he mentions. Boy, he sounds like a seminary professor. I've had uh, many professors like him. And he says, as two reasons. One, we have seen the implication of the relationships between verses 1 and 2, which we just read, and verses 3 through 8, which we'll cover here in a minute. And and that is, I cannot fully renew my mind, in verse 2, without the active help of other believers. He goes on to say, he says, I cannot understand what the Scripture teaches apart from dialogue with others who are reading the same Scripture. I cannot live the life of a disciple of Christ apart from the nurturing context of a community of believers who encourage me, pray for me, set an example for me. I cannot discern the blind spots in my obedience to Christ without other believers to point them out to me. And here is where the attitude of arrogance that Paul rebukes in verse 3 can get in the way. We think of ourselves more highly than we ought and so conclude that we don't need the help of others. It's in light of this uh, that there's no Lone Ranger Christians that I want to consider in our passage today. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 12, and we'll read verses 3 through 8. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, and so we 
who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, as we strive to understand what you would have for us to know, we ask that you open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding today, Lord, what it means to serve with the gifts that you have given each and every one of us today. Move among us. May we feel your presence. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the church, in the church, God has gifted many of us in many different ways. Our responsibility is to exercise those spiritual gifts that he has given us. And when we do, and we do so properly, and in the context that we are supposed to exercise them in, we will build each other up in the faith, and we'll find that there is harmony within the body of Christ. Now, uh, I want... uh, There's a lot of us in this room who grew up in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, some of us in the 50s, Brother Chuck, and... uh, but uh, I want you to think back. There's a, uh, there's a rock and roll singer by the name of Bob Dylan. Anybody remember Bob Dylan? Okay. There was a song that he wrote back in the 70s, late 70s actually. And the song is called, Gotta Serve Somebody. And the lyrics go like this. He says, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now, believe it or not, that really aligns with Scripture. He is telling the truth there. We all will serve somebody. Paul writes, if you go back in Romans, Romans 6 verse 16, he says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. You see, Paul's thesis on salvation, and, and it's quite a thesis as we go through chapters 1 through, uh, through 8, and, and he's talking about righteousness, and he talks about how we are saved from sin and we are saved to serve God. A little further down in Romans 6, 22, he writes, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefits resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. We serve the Lord as living and holy sacrifices. Interesting thing, I, I was reading the other day, he says, that, you know, there's a problem with being a living sacrifice. And he says, the problem with living sacrifices is that they tend to crawl off the altar. You know, we're not always where we we're supposed to be. We're not always the sacrifice that we were called to be. And he says, when we serve as living and holy sacrifices, we need to understand as we serve the Lord, it is not to earn our salvation, but we serve because we have been saved, because we possess the salvation which only comes from God through the shed blood of Jesus, as we covered in, in Romans 12.1. It is our spiritual or reasonable act of worship. We serve the Lord. And so now we look at where the rubber meets the road. How does this look? Romans 12, verse 3. For through the ga- grace given to me, I say to every one of you, uh, everyone among you, 
not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, by the grace given to me. He's talking about the gift given to him. The the, uh, interesting word here, grace, it it is the uh, Greek word charis, charis. And down down later, we're going to be talking about the word gift, and it's charismata. And it's all from the same root word. It talks about the gifts from God. And it's the gift that was given to Paul is the spiritual gift of apostleship. Now, as a, as the gift of being an apostle, and it's both a gift and a position, there, and it's, it's, uh, he has authority in that position that comes with that office. And so Paul, utilizing that gifts, he gives out instructions. And they start off with, he says, we are not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. In today's vernacular, I would say uh, we're not to get the big head. We're not to have inflated egos. We're not to think that uh, uh, the whole world hinges on us, or in this case, in context, that, that the church is dependent upon us solely. Now, I want you to understand that, solely. Church is dependent upon us but it it depends upon us individually, collectively. We all come together, and God has given us gifts so that we can mesh together and carry out the mission of the church. And he says, "But, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Now, if you've got the New King James, it says to think soberly. And this is where no Christian Lone Rangers comes in. We are not to overestimate our abilities to be a living sacrifice. We are not to estimate our abilities to do it on our own. We need one another. We need to be with God's people. We can't do it sitting on our couch. Now, I understand there are people listening and are tuned in that can't be here today. Because they're sick, they're in the hospital, they're deployed overseas. Shout out to the Collins who are overseas. But they're worshiping with a group over there. They're just keeping connected with us because we're online. And we thank God for for the technology that we have to reach out. But it is important that we are here with God's people. And, 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 and we're not to have overestimate our abilities that, you know, I can worship God anywhere. Well, that's true, but there's, not, uh, there's, no, there's there is no substitute for worshiping with God's people. Being with God's people, being where the Spirit is, and and we need uh, we we cannot stay home thinking we have got this by ourselves. Nothing in the gospel ever suggests or encourages anyone to have a superiority complex. We are not to overestimate our abilities. Galatians six four, Paul writes. He says, "May it never be that I would boast." except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has come, uh, has been crucified to me and I to the world. We are not to overestimate our abilities. You know, sometimes, yep, uh, we, 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 we've got, uh, we've got uh, settled with being with children. God bless those that are doing the children's church in the back. And we talked about them. But you know, sometimes a child will come up with a little nugget of wisdom that will blow me away. You know? And they say it out of innocence. We can learn from children. We learn from one another. We're not to overestimate our abilities. But the fact is, as we consider spiritual gifts, all abilities, whether natural or spiritual, every bit of it comes from God. It says, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. He has given us different abilities. God has dealt with us individually. And what God has given to you, what has he given to you to use for him? We're not to belittle any ability or talent. 
And oftentimes, it's not overestimating our abilities is the problem in the church. It is underestimating our abilities in the church. You know, uh, understand, you know, there's sometimes, well, I can't do that. Well, have you tried? You'd be surprised at how God enables us to do things if God is calling us to do it. Consider Moses for a second. Do you, you remember the story? Uh, God called Moses uh, by the burning bush, and God reveals his name to him, and he calls for Moses to be God's spoke person to Pharaoh. And, and, and immediately, you know, um, Moses goes what so many of us does. He says, but, 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 but God, but God. Uh, Exodus 4.10 Then Moses says to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor in since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Boy, I identify with uh, Moses. I I can never be in a debate. I have a hard time arguing with people. I I get the best comeback three nights later in the middle of the night. Ah, that's what I should have said. I, I, I identify with Moses. I understand what he's saying. But, but, but God, we have a thousand reasons why we can't exercise the gift that God has given us. Exodus 4, 11 to 12, the Lord said to him, who made man's mouth? Or who made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be your mouthpiece and teach you what you are to say. More to that story, but understand, I want to look at that. Even Moses made excuses. You know, when asked to do something in a church and things, uh, we don't necessarily go, but, 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 but God, and and we do. Uh, The standard, when asked, do we need to do something, the standard Baptist response is, "Mm, I've got to go pray about it. I've got to go pray about it. And that's the last we hear of it. Uh, and I've told this story before, and I've got to repeat it again because it, 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 it so warmed my heart. Uh, when I was a uh, Sunday school director in another church, in fact, it was over at First Baptist down the road here, and I made an announcement one Sunday morning. We have an international class, international ladies, uh, a lot of Thai and Vietnamese and others, and I need someone to lead uh, a class where English is a second language sort of thing. And I had, uh, Gail Smith was her name. She went to be with the Lord some years ago. And after the service, uh, she, she it, it, we were hardly through singing, and the last amen wasn't out yet, and she came up to me and said, I'm your person. And I said, well, do you need to go consider, think about it? Do you need to go pray about it? She goes, no. I'd already prayed. I've already prayed. And I was just waiting for, she said, I didn't know what it was going to be, but when I heard it, that was it. And she led that class for a better part of 20 years. And that class grew and flourished under her leadership. The other side of sound judgment or thinking soberly is not to underestimate the gift that God gives us. It's like that song. We sang it a few Sundays ago. Trust and obey. We're to trust and obey. Sometimes that means stepping outside of our comfort zone. Continuing in verses 4 and 5, Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, we read, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of, of members one of another. The implication here is not to be missed. Each of us have been placed within the body of Christ for a reason. And we each have a function, meaning we have a responsibility to the Bible, uh, to the body, excuse me, to the body. And, and, and God has equipped each of us uh, differently. Bob read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Interesting thing, 
Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he wrote this chapter, which is a, a pretty much a parallel to these verses that we're looking at today. He wrote those uh, a good two years before he wrote to the Romans. And, and so these are things that he was already well acquainted with. And, and in, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6, Bob read earlier, he says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of ministers in the, in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. We need to give God a little credit here. He put us where we are for a reason. He knew just what Rosemont needed. And he brought us here. You see, God uh, God has equipped us not for our profit, but for the profit of all. We are, are in the body to serve the body, not for the body to serve us. That doesn't mean we don't get served, but our purpose here is to serve the body. Too often we go around and we hunt for churches. If we're new in an area, we hunt for a church that's all about what they can do for me rather than what has God equipped me to do for the body. What has God equipped me to do right where you're at? You know, uh, we, we go by and and I don't care what church you go to, you can go into a church and say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And we're no exception. We've got things that we could be doing better, no doubt. But you know, if God has shown it to you, maybe he has shown you a problem for a reason. And you know, those that he speaks to and those that he shows a problem, maybe you've been equipped to fix the problem, or at least be part of the solution. Uh, you, you know, it, it's it's it, go back, go back to verse four and five again. It says individually members one of another. Uh, we could go through all of chapter twelve of First Corinthians, and it tells how the you know, if we're all the eye, if everybody was an eye, where would the hearing be, and so on and so forth? We got different gifts for a reason. Different gifts for a reason. We're members of one another. Christianity is not a solo experience. Each part serves the body. Not the body serves the parts. It doesn't mean that we don't get ministered to, but we're in this together. And, and it's not up to the part to, to demand what the other parts are to do. You know, God has called me here for a reason. And I do what I am called to do. The parts do not join the body and say, what's in it for me? But rather they say, how can I contribute? What is, what is required of me? Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4 Paul writes, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with a humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. It's kind of funny how that works. We're concerned and we decide to be uh, put on a degree of humility and we go take care of other people's needs. It's funny how our needs get taken care of in the process. It's also funny. It's also, you know, it's like looking for happiness. You look for happiness, you're never going to find it. But you look for happiness for others, and you'll find that it will come to you. That's just the way God works. That's just the way he works. We are placed, uh, we, we are to place the rights and welfares of others above ourselves. All gifts are necessary. 1 Corinthians 12, 29 to 30. Uh, Paul asks these questions. He says, are they, uh, are all not apostles? Are they? Are uh, all are not prophets? Are they? All are not teachers? Are they? Are uh, all are not, ah, I get it spit out. All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gift of healings, do they? All do not speak tongues, do they? All do not interpret. You know, we all can't be doing the same thing. 
You know, who's going to clean the toilets? God bless you, Jan. I love Jan. <laughs> I, I, but for more reasons than you know. And the things that she does. And, you know, and that's uh, that, there's a number of us like here. And it's good to see Kathy here. Kathy in the office, she does things that y'all will never know about. You know, it's, 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 it's taken us all together, those that teach Sunday school. Well, pastor ought to teach. Well, I do, but I can't teach all the Sunday school classes. I, it, it, you know, there are, things, there are people that need to be taken care of. I can't take care of everybody. One, you don't pay enough. <laughs> Two... Too, I just don't have the time and do the things that I've been called to do. You, you know, there's, there's, there are all kinds of things that needs to be done for the church to function. And understand, as we are looking at these verses 3 through 8, we're talking about our relationship within the body of Christ and how it takes every one of us for the body of Christ to function. When we consider what talents and abilities, yes, even the spiritual gifts that we may possess, we must think soundly and soberly about ourselves how to properly use the gifts that God has given us within the body of Christ. Moving on to verse 6. It says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given uh, given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. It's a waste to have a gift and not use it. God gave us a gift for a reason. What is that gift? I don't know. Look at that word gifts. Uh, charismata in the Greek, related to the grace that was given to Paul. It's the same root word, if you will. It, it, it says here, Paul is clearly talking about spiritual gifts. Now, a lot of us comes with some natural talent. Uh, if all of a sudden... Uh, I were to start singing beautifully, it would be a spiritual gift because I don't have that talent naturally. But understand, whether it's a natural talent or a spiritual gift, it's all from God. And God has given us gifts that we're not normally equipped with. Now understand, and you've heard this before, God doesn't call the equipped to serve he calls the, he equips those he calls to serve. And so if you see a need, you see, you see a function that needs to be performed and say, well, I never did anything like that before. Or what's the other Baptist word we use? Uh, we've never done it that way before. And there's, there's a variety of things out there. And God shows you something. Maybe he has equipped you to fill that need, whatever it is, whatever it is. And so when we, it, it, it says, what, what is it that we have? And all believers have at least one gift, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. But to each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, we can we can we can go through these lists. There's a whole laundry list over here in uh, uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 12. There's a, a short list that we're going to be looking at here. That's not all inclusive. That's just a few representative stuff. Uh, I, I believe uh, God has given us uh, with uh, with the gift of the Spirit that we have all of those different gifts included. Some are stronger than others in various. Uh, proportions. And how does that work out? I haven't a clue. But I know that we're all capable of some of those things. Uh, Some of us are better at it than others, and so each gift is unique to each person. So Paul just lists a few of these gifts. and let's Let's just run through these that Paul uh, mentions here in our passage today, looking at the second part of verse 6 into verse 8. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, uh, he who teaches in his teachings, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. 
Let's look at prophecy. If prophecy, let us prophesy. It, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, Paul says, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comforts to men. If God calls you and equips you to edification and exhortation and comfort to others, then do it. Then do it. Then do it. I, I love Chuck came up in his testimony today. God has given everybody the ability, every, every believer, as Chuck had mentioned, has a story to tell, has a testimony. We need to share it. We need to share it. You, you, you'd be surprised whether it's to share it from here to other believers or to your neighbor or coworker. And you know, if you step out on faith, you step out of your comfort zone, and you step out and you say, this is what God has done to me, for me, and through me, and you start explaining it to somebody, you'll be surprised when you find out that the Spirit has gone ahead of you and prepared a heart to hear it. Amen. It's not about eloquence of speech. It's about the heart that brings it. If service, if service, uh, uh, some of your translation may say ministry, okay? That's a nice church word, ministry. In the Greek, it's the word uh, diokana, uh, which means to serve. It's the same root word that we get our word deacon from, which means servant. A deacon is a servant. If we have the gift of serving others, then we need to be busy serving others. He who teaches in teaching. The biblical word uh, use of this word, teaching, means someone who can cause learning to happen in others. In other words, they can explain things that people can understand, especially in morals or in, in, in biblical doctrine. If you can teach, you need to be doing that. And it's not just necessarily in the classroom, teaching. There are those around us that we know that we need to take under our arm and mentor one-on-one. -on -one. That's teaching. And some of us need to be busy about mentoring one person. Just one person. He who exhorts in his exhortation, uh, uh, that means to be an encourager, a helper. The Greek word here is uh, parakalon, which is the same basic word that's used in John 14, verse 16 to describe the Holy Spirit. Uh, the paraclete, which means the helper, to be a helper, to come alongside. You know, sometimes people need someone just to stand with them. Think about when you've been sitting in the hospital room and, or you're in the waiting room and waiting on a loved one and someone just comes and sits with you and holds your hand. And sometimes you don't even have to say a word. He who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. You see, the biblical gift of giving is not just simply a person that has a lot of stuff to give away, but it's rather the one who is free from being possessed by his things so that they can be used of God as a channel of blessing to others. You know, it's the thing uh, I, I heard from a lot of people. I give them the shirt off their backs, and there are people I know who have done so. You know, if you've got something to give, you know, and if there's the need, give it. He who leads with diligence, by definition, by the world's definition, the leader is one who, through ambition and persistence and good fortune, has climbed the ladder of success. You know, I've had people tell me, I want to be the boss so I can kick back, put my feet up, and direct other people what to do. You know, I, I've been in the, most of you all know, I, I spent 25 years in the military. And I tell you one thing I have learned, uh, both in the military world and in the secular world as well. The best boss is the hardest worker of all. And in the biblical sense, we talk about, you've heard this buzzwords in church circles about being a, a servant leader. 
And I find a lot of times the thing that I do best is serve other people, enabling them to fully use their gifts and to do their job. To lead oftentimes means to serve. And then all you have to do with people who are motivated, and as you motivate people and as you lead them and as you serve them, enable them to do their gifts, and all you need to do is kind of point them in a direction and turn them loose. We have a number of ministries like that. Uh, I look at Elaine over here in our shoebox ministry, and she said she had a heart for that, and all I had to do was say go. (laughs) And our cancer ministry with Toby over here. And we've got other ministries like that. You know, that all I have to do is go, (laughs) and I get to be the cheerleader. Uh, You know, that's, that's what we do. That's what we do. How has God called you and equipped you? He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Mercy is the need to help the helpless, care for the sick, feed the hungry, care for the aged. And it's, it's more than out of obligation. It's done with a smile. A lot of us, I'll do what I got to do. You know, but, but that, notice what Paul says. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And oftentimes, that's what makes the day. You're happy in what God has called you to do. In other words, one of my commentators mentioned, he says, when we look at all of these together, and as we look at uh, verses 6 through 8 and we put it in together, the implication seems to be that we are not to wait around for instruction, for a mystical move of the Spirit in order to minister to the body of Christ. We are to do that which is obvious to us and which we feel compelled and capable of doing. And I'll add to that, if, 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 if we feel the need is obvious, and the Holy Spirit has revealed that to us, then we ought to be compelled to jump in and do what needs to be done and then be surprised on how the Spirit has equipped you to do it. Has equipped you to do it. Uh, You know, I've mentioned this before. Folks mentioned to me, and they asked me, and they said, you know, how do I know if the Spirit is leading me here and there and looking at major career moves or or, or, or uh, family questions and so on and so forth. And uh, what, is, what is God's will? And the question is, are you doing the will that you know right now? Are you doing the will of God that you know in your heart right now? And the more you do, the more God will reveal to you, and it will be obvious. In short, Paul is saying there's no slackers in the use of, of what God has gifted you with. God gave you a gift for a reason. And our first move is to use it within the body of Christ. The question is, what is my, what is my gift? Well, you've got to get busy and find out. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, that gift is revealed by the needs that are revealed to you. God doesn't call us to do anything that he doesn't equip us to do. Now, granted, there's a learning process. Granted, uh, you know, I question my gift of preaching, and, uh, and Ellen can attest to this. I, I preach a whole lot better now than I did 20 years ago. Got a little practice day, Sunday after Sunday, but you got to exercise. you got to exercise your gift. You know, uh, singing just didn't happen overnight. It, it, we we got to work at it, and we got to exercise these things, and we've got to develop what God has given us. And 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 when we see a need, oftentimes the thing is, is well, somebody needs to take care of this, and somebody may be you. Now, the thing I do want to mention as I close. Perhaps somebody here doesn't see a need. You don't have a calling. And it's all because you don't know the one who opens the eyes, that opens the ears, that gives the ability that's needed. It's all about knowing Jesus. It is all about knowing him. And when we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
and we become that living and holy sacrifice, all of a sudden, things will appear before us and we will see how we can faithfully serve him and he'll equip you to do it. It's all about knowing Jesus. Because without knowing him, understand, we don't do any good thing before our salvation. Good in the eyes of God. We may do good in the eyes of the world, but understand it's only the Spirit through us that we're able to do good for God. It's all about knowing Jesus. And to know Him, His salvation, will open our eyes to the possibility around us. This message today was mostly for those who know Jesus, who are truly part of the body. But as we come to this time of invitation, our altar is always open. I'm going to be standing down front. I'm always going to be open to receive those who want to know Jesus. It's all about knowing him. And for the rest of us, are we faithful? We're going to sing about being faithful. Are we faithful in using the gifts that God has given us? He doesn't it give us, you know, it's uh, oftentimes, I know like talents, uh, uh, talents oftentimes it's a use it or lose it sort of thing. When I was uh, when I was a pilot, we had what we call currency requirements. I had to fly every so often in order to keep the skills, just so I can I can do it safely. Uh, and I believe a lot of times God's gifts are like that. We've got to use them. We've got to develop them. We've got to get better at it. Because if we don't use it, there's no reason why it might not just fade away. What has God given for you to do? And what gifts has he called you to use? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to this time of invitation. We come to this time where where we come before you and we think about what you have called us. Things that we know that we ought to be doing and we ask forgiveness for those things that we know that we should have done and haven't. And Lord, I pray that you give us a renewed spirit, a renewed ability, a renewed calling. And Lord, that our vision be clear. And Lord, that we could have the boldness to act in the ways that you have called us to be, to be the witness to the world that you have called us to be. We're asking for you to move among us today. Lord, affect any decision that might need to be made. And we're giving Jesus all the honor, and all the glory. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.